I was going to say that. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so there are a couple of, uh, you know, we have these internal discussions, not quite internal discussions, but discussions that are at a certain level, and we only invite certain people that we think um, already have a, a level of unity and awareness. Um, and part of that is so that we don't have to have the same discussions over and over again every time we do a presentation. So one of the things that we um, consider kind of a, a baseline of agreement during these discussions is, for example, anti-capitalism. We consider capitalism a bad idea. It needs to be gotten rid of. We need to have a new kind of society. That, what that will be, we haven't agreed upon yet, but so we assume starting out that you know, for this purpose of this discussion, we want to get rid of capitalism. Um, so with that, uh, the title of my presentation is um, From Overthrowing the Profit System to Not for Profit. And it's kind of about the progression of the movement from a movement that at one point was dedicated to try and overthrow this system to one that has become mired in um, the NGO not-for-profit model. And when I first gave this presentation a couple of years ago, I was a lot less down on NGOs at the time. I've done a lot more studying since then, and I'm not a bit, <laughs> no longer any kind of fan of them. So how do we kind of get to where we are today? Well, let me start off with a quote from a comrade of mine up in, in New York. He said, the condition of revolutionary work today is historically rooted within the development of the world system into its current coordinates of neoliberalism and US empire with the collapse of revolutionary movements in this country alongside the collapse of actually existing socialism. And he had those quotes. Um, the nonprofit industrial complex is a global feature, and it, it is, despite its name, part of the political apparatuses of the state in stripping away with one hand to give half back with the other, capitalism with a human face. The NGO is now the predominant organizational form that pervades in the movement today. Um, and if you've got any kind of sense of the left in the United States, you'll notice that we have a very small number of actual organized political organizations, and we've got a lot of not-for-profits and NGOs, people doing not-for-profit with NGO work. And how did, you know, 40 years ago, it was the exact opposite case. So what was going on 40 years ago? Well, it was the end of the 1960s, um, and at that time, to a lot of people, it really seemed like socialist revol global socialist revolution was on the agenda. Uh, both the rulers and the ruled felt that the system's time was up. Um, even in the White House, there, you know, the talk of revolution was not a matter of if, but when. Um, and what kind of things were going on? Well, the end of post-war prosperity was coming, you know, was happening. We had what was called stagflation. The economists said it could never happen that you have both inflation and high unemployment at the same time. And yet that was what the West was experiencing. Um, more and more people were getting laid off, prices were skyrocketing. At the same time, the United States had to go off the gold standard. It was no longer powerful enough to say, you know, our money is, is worth its weight in gold, or is actually worth more than gold. Um, and the oil producing nations <coughs> of the world you know, felt strong enough, empowered enough, that they said, all right, we're cutting off your supply. You know, we're only going to allow you to have this much. And so there really was this sense of, you know, the, you know, the, the, the walls were closing in. Around the world, there were anti-imperialist movements succeeding everywhere. Um, in Indochina, the United States suffered its first foreign military defeat, and that was not in you know, small part due to um, you know, what was going on in the United States itself. The military itself began to resist the war effort. And there were mutinies on aircraft carriers. The military in Vietnam decided to stop going out and fighting on missions. They started killing their own officers. There were unions being formed in the military. We had mass movements in the United States, the civil rights movement the peace movement, American Indians, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans were all organizing against the system. So it really was a very exciting time to be alive. I mean, even in the popular culture, people were saying, well, after the revolution. Um, you know, and there are songs about the revolution, not just the Beatles' revolution song, but like, 
a lot of the 60s music, you, you know, they talk about when, you know, when revolution gets here. So it really was this sense that, wow, this, it's going to happen. It's really going to happen. Um, coming out of that, a lot of when uh, the, the, at that moment where it felt like, you know, globally the uh, capitalism was going to break through, a couple of events happened that really gave the empire a new lease on life. And the first was detente. And the Soviets decided to kind of back off putting pressure on the U.S. and they stopped giving as much support to international revolutionary movements. And Nixon went to China to exploit a rift between the Chinese and the Soviets. And what ended up happening is the Chinese, which had been a very, you know, for whatever you want to say about the political system there and how they treated their own people, um, they had been a very progressive force internationally. Um, they had inspired lots of people around the world. They had been giving aid to different movements. And after Nixon goes there, they kind of switch sides. And so you see them supporting counter-revolutionary movements in Africa against um, revolts there. Uh, and so we've kind of got like the two major forces, whatever you want to think about them, um, you know, kind of at the moment they had that victory seemed on the, you know, like it was going to happen, you know, they stopped. They, they gave the West a rest. And the West had a moment to catch and breathe. And in that moment, they granted rights. They started granting rights to, to people at home. They, you know, uh, black people started getting elected in serious numbers for the first time in the 70s. Women's rights started to come to the fore. And so a lot of these major mass movements in the United States began to, to settle down. But out of them grew what is called the new communist movement. And it's hard for us to think about it today. But in the early 1970s, there were thousands and thousands of thousands of people organized into communist groups. The Socialist Workers Party today, which maybe has 100 or so people, had 2,500 people in the 70s. When their candidate ran for president, they got 76,000 votes in the mid-70s. Uh, the Revolutionary Communist Party, which just pulled itself together, was in such a position that it was able to send its people into various struggles in the workplaces around the United States, in the coal mines and trucks, and trucking fights, and you know there were wildcats and, and coal mines who were shut down, and truckers were just blocking the highways. Um, it was a very exciting time, um, and these groups were even in a position powerful enough that they could have people who weren't even doing political work just in case somebody needed to hide. So like it took a year for them to find Angela Davis, and it took forever for them to bring down the SLA, whatever you want to think of them, because there were people who weren't actually doing political work but were connected to the movement so that people could go and hide. You know, could compare and contrast that to what just happened in LA, um, where a lot of people had been on to get. Uh, so that's kind of the, what happened then. And these groups, the human beings are kind of uh, symbol, symbolic recognizing creatures. We look for patterns in nature and history. And the communists in this period looked to try and understand what they were going through, tried to look to previous moments in history and say, ah, oh, this is what we're going through. And so they looked back and they saw the 1905 revolution. And then only 12 years later, there was a massive revolution in Russia. Um, so they decided that's what we're going through. You know, the 1960s is ebbed, but in the 1980s we're going to overthrow this thing. And what we need to do now is work our, you know, our, our fingers to the bone, you know, knuckle down. And they went into this period of massive hyperactivity, which really ended up burning them out when the wave of movement conservatism actually happened instead. You know, it started. You could see an inkling of that in 1977 when the death penalty is re-legalized when the Hyde Amendment is first passed, which is now, which had to be passed every year up until uh, the Obama Health Care Act was passed and became a permanent law, um, which forbade the use of federal dollars for abortion. Um, and so when Reagan gets elected, when the, the PATCO strike gets smashed by Reagan, um, all of these, and, and when the expected revolution did not occur, all of these people really kind of burnt out. The groups began nosediving, but they still, you know, they still had their beliefs. 
and they still wanted to do something to help the community. So a lot of them would get involved in labor unions, a lot of them got involved in community organizing. Um, and this is really the period when we see the NGO begin to take off, and more and more people you know, stop doing active revolutionary work and start doing uh, <coughs> NGO work. So, what exactly is an NGO? Well, it's a non-governmental organization, but businesses are non-governmental organizations too, but that's not you know, specifically meant by an NGO, which is usually a kind of not-for-profit model. Um, and the World Bank defines them as private organizations that pursue activities to relieve suffering, promote the interests of the poor, protect the environment, provide basic social services, or undertake community development. But these aren't the only things that are NGOs. Churches are NGOs. Universities are NGOs. Foundations are NGOs. <coughs> Think tanks like the Cato Institute is an NGO. And so we have all of these other things that fit into this category of NGO. Now, we're not going to be talking about hospitals and universities and whatnot today. Um, I don't think. I feel like Michael Rubio. <laughs> you, got, you got to make it a little more awkward. <laughs> you got to really freeze in the head. <laughs> In Russia itself, they have 277,000 NGOs. India has 3.3 million. It is now estimated that over 15% of total overseas development aid is channeled to NGOs, which comes out to be about $8 billion. <coughs> so this is not an insignificant portion of the economy. It's not an insignificant amount of money. <clears throat> so, when you want to understand who sets the agenda, you look at who gives them the money. And for NGOs, for not-for-profits, the money comes from my primarily from two sources, either from the, the government itself in the, in the shape of government grants, or it comes from foundations in the, in the shape of foundational grants. Um, so what the foundations are really the key to understanding what, you know, the problem of NGOs and why they have become such a burden to the movement, why they've become such a problem. So let's talk a little bit about them. Um, <coughs> foundations exist in order to shield inheritance tax, shield wealth from inheritance taxes. So one of the very first foundations that was set up was set up by Rockefeller. Um, and he put all of his wealth in there. And when you put, you know, that money goes to a charitable foundation, it's not a tax. Right now, the tax on, on inheritance is about 35%. Um, that may have changed in the last year or so. Any money that goes to a foundation is tax free. And so we hear about like Bill Gates giving all his wealth away. Um, we hear about Warren Buffett giving all his wealth away. We hear that Paris Hilton is not going to inherit any any of our parents' wealth. All that money is going into the foundation, in, going into foundations. But who controls the foundation? When Rockefeller set up his foundation. His children became the you know were the ones who controlled it. You know Bill and Melinda Gates control their foundation. Their children will control their foundation. The Hilton children will control the Hilton's foundation. So they'll still have all that money, but none of it gets taxed. None of it goes to the government. Um, and you know, however we might want to, because you know, the government probably just want to use that money to buy more cops and repress us. But um, it, you know, we do exercise a, a, a little bit of democratic control, and we do kind of 
have the ability to say, well, we want, you know, aside from that money that you're, you're giving, the, uh, giving the police to buy tanks with, you know, we want to have these road sticks and things like that, we'll pay off some of our debt. And tanks that these um, <laughs> In fact, Bill Gates' wealth came because his mother was on the foundation board with the head of IBM. And so that's how he got his connection to sell his you know, to, to sell his software to IBM, and then it became the standard, you know, much later. There are over 60, 67,000 foundations in the United States. The top 100 U.S. foundations control over $200 billion of assets at the end of 2010. Um, the high point was. Um, this is in different, you know, that was in, in $2,010. Uh, the high point was over $141 billion in 2007 in 1975 from a little more than $30 billion in 1975, which is about 470% growth. Um, but in the recession came, you know, they took a little bit of a hit, they lost about 20% of their value, and, you know, well, we lost our jobs and our homes and lives and whatnot. So, you know, it goes a little bit of sharing. Um, now, this money, these foundations, give them a considerable amount of control. Uh, more than 50 years ago, around 1914, so this, is, this was written a little while ago. <laughs> so I'm quoting, quote, more than 50 years ago, the Morgan firm decided to infiltrate left-wing political movements in the United States. This was relatively easy to do since these groups were starved for funds and eager for a voice to reach them. <laughs> Wall Street supplied both. The purpose was not to destroy, dominate, or take over. It was really threefold. To keep informed about the thinking of left-wing or liberal groups. To provide them with a mouthpiece so that they could blow off steam. And three, to have a final veto on their publicity and possibly their actions if they ever went radical. So during the Vietnam War, this was something that the SLC, the King's movement came up against. Whereas he was beginning to go more radical, there we started to pull more money. Um, in 1967, King held a strategy meeting where he wanted to take a more active stance against opposing the Vietnam War, noting that he was willing to break with the Johnson administration, even if the Southern Christian Leadership Conference lost some financial support. Despite it already being a weak financial position, the contribution so 40% less than the previous year. In this case, it seems King was referring to the potential loss of foundation support as, after his first speech against the war a week later, he again voiced his concerns that his new position would jeopardize an important Ford Foundation grant. So, um, and when I did this uh, discussion a couple years ago at um, the Food Not Bombs uh, statewide gathering. Keith McHenry was there, and he mentioned that he had used to work for an NGO in Arizona, and there was some big protest that was completely unconnected with what they were doing. So they weren't going to have any political aspect to it. But the, one of their grant, one of their, it was, uh, as I remember now, it was about a, um, a development that was taking place. And the people were trying to block the development because it was sensitive land. Um, this NGO had nothing to do with land development or whatnot. But their major founder was um, involved with the development. And they told them that if you go to, if any of your people go to this, we're going to pull your grants. So even though they had nothing to do with it, even though they weren't going to take an active role politically, they said that your people were involved with your organization. And if they show up and we find out about it, we're pulling your money. Now, a lot of the info, you know, a lot of the early footwork was done by a group called uh, um, Insight, which is a uh, it's a women's group, and they wrote a book called uh, Revolution Will Not Be Funded. And this they started a lot of this work when they uh, got a grant from the Ford Foundation for a project. It was about a hundred thousand dollars, and at some point, somebody in the Ford Foundation went and took a look. At Insight's web, they'd already given them already given them the money. Insight had the check, put it in the bank. Ford found somebody from the Ford Foundation went to their website and found out that Insight was opposed to the occupation of Palestine. So the Ford Foundation came back and said, "Give us the money back." 
you know, and they took the money back. And so, in you know, this group, women's group was like, all right, what is this thing that we've really gotten ourselves into? And so that's where a lot of this work about trying to understand um, the, you know, the NGO model and the power of foundations begins um, a few years ago. Now, the, the way that they've influenced the movement is in a bunch of different ways. Um, but first off, one of the things that they've done is they've tried to have the movement professionalized. So uh, when a lot of people start their own movements, it's you know just who do you know and the people in the community. So you go and you organize people in the community to try and take control of their own um, their neighborhoods, their workplaces. Um, and the leadership comes from the community, the the ideas, the structure, everything, they do it themselves. But when the foundation is involved they want to have people that are responsible. They want to have people that have college degrees. You know, so you have to have a degree in social work now in order to run an NGO, to run a community organization. Now, how many people that are actually in the work in these communities have college degrees? You know, so what ends up happening is that the, nat the, the organic native um, leadership gets removed just so they can get some money, and they get people who come in from the outside. Most people with college degrees in this country happen to be white, so that ends up pushing a lot of people of color out of these positions. Um, <coughs> they have to have a structured leadership, so you have to have a vice president, a, president, a vice president, a secretary, a treasurer, tax forms, um, and so you end up spending more and more of your work and your effort just on this organizational kind of jump for this paper report. Um, and one of the things that ends up happening is, is that foundations don't like to give their money to things that fail. So no matter what you do, whether it worked or not, it has to be packaged as a success. Because if you come back and say, well, you know, this is an experiment, we tried to do this thing, and it didn't work, you get no more money. They're like, well, you're a group that can't get things done. And so you end up, these groups end up stuck doing stuff that doesn't work just so they can have a job, just so they can have get, keep the money coming in. Um, yeah, and we can see that with, uh, for example, there was a movement against uh, domestic violence. And I don't, you know, some of you are old enough to remember that there was a lot of struggle, you know, and it was coming out of the community, and a lot of it was based, based on trying to get people to learn how to live without violence, how to, to reconcile you know, um, people, to, to build community support against violence. And what ends up happening is these movements, because of the foundations, because of the government, they end up getting doing work uh, that increases laws against domestic violence. And I'm not saying that domestic violence is something that we should be like, oh, poo poo. You know, it's not that big of a deal. But what ends up happening is, is that instead of trying to make things better, the movement ends up enforcing or, or enhancing the power of the state. And so laws are tough and police are, more police are brought in. Um, and this has a kind of, of backfire effect. And now, if you have a problem with your partner, um, if you go to the police, it can make things worse. They can end up going to jail and you love this person. You don't want them really to go to jail unless things are really bad. Um, <coughs> and so a lot of people end up not seeking help. But it's all professionalized. Uh, one of the things that's happened is that the growth of NGOs has allowed the state to start dropping off functions that are normally considered, you know, that we had fought to put on the state, for example, <coughs> unemployment in the 1930s, our grandparents and great grandparents fought and won the right for state <coughs> unemployment relief. And these, you know, these things were taken care of from the state. Um, 
here, you know, but more and more these functions are being offloaded into private organizations. So for example, here in Florida, we have something called Workforce One, which takes care of our unemployment for the most part. Um, and this allows the state of Florida to close all of their unemployment offices except for two. So there's one in Orlando and there's one in Tallahassee. And if you live someplace besides Orlando or Tallahassee, and you have a real problem that you need to talk to somebody from the state to get taken care of, you know, that's not going to happen. You know, Workforce One can help you with like learning how to make a resume and you know, and you know, learning what you know and helping uh, find um, a list of jobs in your area, you know, stuff that anybody with a computer or access to the library or a newspaper can really do. Um, <coughs> But there's five and a half million people in South Florida nearest unemployment office if you need to actually talk to them. There's a free mile drive that's almost 200 miles away from here. You know, God forbid you live in the Keys. Uh, <coughs> or you can try calling them on the phone. I mean, when I was unemployed, it literally took me two weeks to get a human being on the phone because they are so understaffed. Um, so that's you know that's one of the ways that, that the state offloaded you know that and it's a, I mean it's a vital function to the point that only 16 percent of the people in Florida who are eligible for unemployment can get it are collecting it. Um, that's how bad that system is, and it you know that serves a function and, you know um, so the state's not having to pay their unemployment. A lot of you know we saw during the Bush administration a lot of aid was being pushed off into these faith-based initiatives. And so a lot of um, charity work, like if you had you know, trouble with uh, rent or your electricity or um, you know, uh, food, you know, you need food, instead of going to the state, and you know, don't get me wrong, the, the dealing with the state programs is always a headache and a nightmare. Um, and, but when they go to these state-based initiatives, well, for one thing, the, you know, the, the which groups get the money depended heavily on who's in office. So the vast majority of organizations that got this faith-based aid, aid were evangelical Christian groups. Um, and so you see a, a wall begin to be eroded between the church and state. And I don't know how many of you people have, know who Barbara Ehrenreich is. Um, she's a left-wing author. She wrote a book a few years ago called Nickel and Dime, and in it, she discussed, you know, she, what she did is she spent time going around the country trying to live off of minimum wage in different places, had different results, and she went to one town, and a woman that she was staying with told her that when you move to a new town, the first thing you got to do is hook up with the church, because they'll set you up with an apartment, they'll set you up with clothes, they'll get you a job. Um, and all this stuff is coming through charity, you know, it's, it's being funded through the state. And this has the effect of driving people into the churches, and so people become, end up becoming more religious, become tied to a particular religion. Um, Jews and Muslims need not apply uh, because they weren't getting, especially after 9 11, um, so they weren't getting a lot of this uh, state social aid. And of course, they couldn't get jobs, you can't get jobs at these. Um, these churches, if you're not part of the faith, or if you're, or worse, you're somebody who's opposed, like that the faith considers uh, a problem, like being gay, or in some cases, uh, uh, you know, even still, you know, a relationship with people of a different race. So, you know, that's one of the ways that. NGOs have really begun to be a problem. These, these are faith-based NGOs, not really movement NGOs, but that's where the money's going. 